Let's get started. It's 3.30. So uh, my name is Lee Lin. That's not that important, but it's my pleasure to welcome you, both the people here in person and the virtual audience, uh, to the Charles C. Jones Seminar Series. Um, our speaker is uh, Sean Caston. Uh, Sean got an undergraduate degree in biochemistry from Middlebury. He came to Dartmouth and got a master's degree in Master of Science in Engineering and also a Master of Engineering <coughs> Management in 1998. He went to work for Arthur D. Little, which he said was a good technical finishing school because he got, at least I recall you saying that, Sean, uh, because it, you got to work on an awful lot of projects and see a lot of different perspectives. Consulted for the DOE at one point, uh, and started two companies in the combined heat and power business, one of them Trigen and one of them Recycled Energy. And I remember about five years ago, pretty much, uh, and by the way, was a loyal member of the Thayer School uh, Corporate Advisory Council for years, uh, gave guest lectures in Mark Lacer's course uh, several times. Uh, but about five years ago, I got a call from Sean saying, I'm running for Congress. And uh, He's now been elected to the 6th District in Illinois, which is the western part of the western suburbs around Chicago, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, he was elected with a very large emphasis on climate change, uh, and he's one of very few engineers in Congress. And so it is my very, very great pleasure to, uh, in a sense, welcome Sean back to Sayre School, although not as completely as we imagined. We'll have to fill in some of those pieces later. Uh, and just before we begin, um, there is a reception and a poster session in the atrium. For those of you who don't come to Thayer often, you go out the door and then down the stairs um, that uh, will present some of the energy research going on at the Thayer School. And I want to acknowledge Vanessa Pinney, who has done a lot of work organizing that, an MEM student. So with that, Sean, it's great to have you with us. We're looking forward to a good discussion, and uh, the floor is yours, my friend. Well, thank you so much. And, and Lee, you are far too modest. We should fill in a couple gaps here that the reason I went to Thayer was because of Lee Lind and the, the research he was doing up there and had a passion to knew that I wanted to do something that was at the intersection of technology and business and affecting climate change, and so spent a lot of late nights in Lee's lab and en route to a master's. And when I got here, I said, I don't have, I got an undergraduate in biochemical engineering. I don't have any engineering. And uh, Benoit, you were the dean at the time, as I recall, and helped. We're just flexible in thinking about how to structure a curriculum. And then, of course, worked with Don Castle. So, um, Associate it's, dean, to be precise. Associate dean, okay, okay. Well, in, in any event, I am grateful to you for sort of setting setting me up way back when I wouldn't be here today. So it's just a privilege to be back with you guys. Wish it was in person. Um, so I, what I thought I'd try to do is just talk a little bit about the science of climate change, the politics of dealing with climate change, the technologies, and hopefully leave enough time for some questions on the back end. But I, 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 I had this perfect summation of the, the issue recently. I was in Glasgow as part of the delegation in the COP conference. I had previously been in Madrid. It was a little different this time when we were there actually with Biden and Obama and, and Kerry, as opposed to the last time when it was just 12 of us from Congress representing the entire federal government. But in the course of, of one of the conversations we had, there was a, a woman from Australia, and this sounds better in an Australian accent that I'm not going to try to copy, but she said, she said, when it comes to climate change, the technology is easy. The politics are the crunchy bits. And... And I thought there was such deep wisdom in there because it's true when we talk about throwing away the technology to address climate change actually is pretty easy. We don't acknowledge it, but we should. And the politics really does have a lot of crunchy bits. So I want to talk a little bit about that. But, but, but first, we've got to start with the science because I think the science is so frightening and so misrepresented that it's important for us to understand the facts of where we are. We may not be happy about those facts, but we can't debate them. Um, first point. Uh, I think the earliest evidence that any upright walking hominid burned something is a million years ago in a cave. There's some evidence of, of, of fire. Um, modern hominids, Homo sapiens, they're a couple hundred thousand years old. Um, that's how long we've been on this, this planet. 
50% of all the carbon dioxide we have ever released into the atmosphere, starting from that first fire a million years ago to today, 50% of all of it has been emitted since 1991. The, the scale that we are blowing this up is just, we, we can't fathom how quickly that is, but, but this is a problem that is doubling in those kinds of time frames and it's exponential. The, if you look over the course of human history, you know, if you look at, you know, the evidence such as we can get it of what, you know, historic populations were, what kind of wealth there was to the extent we can capture it. But, you know, you squint your eyes, there was basically no real, no meaningful growth in per capita GDP prior to 1776. And then it took off, not because of the Declaration of Independence, but because of Watt's name engine. Because prior to that point, your ability to access wealth was a function of your ability to access energy and your ability to access energy was basically a function of how many muscles you had access to. So we were, by definition, land constrained and resource constrained. Once we invented the steam engines, followed subsequently by fossil fuels, we had this huge explosion in the amount of energy we could access per capita and wealth per capita. And so the population shot up after 1776, the wealth per capita shot up and our species took off. And so now we're sitting there on this huge expanse. And you know, any of you who've taken an environmental science class are aware that every species that's ever existed on this planet, their population goes through these sinusoidal waves. And the question is, has our species somehow broken that curse and we're just going to do permanently logarithmic? Or are we just too dumb to realize we're on the front end of a sinusoid? Um, these are real hard questions. I'm not telling you I got the answers, but you better be asking them. The last time that atmospheric CO2 levels were as high as they are right now in the atmosphere, sea levels were 60, meter, 60 feet higher. Um, and there is absolutely no reason why we are not on pace to be 60 feet higher. There's some, just some debate between the scientists of how quickly will we get to that point. It takes a long time to build sea ice and glaciers. Um, it doesn't take very long to melt them, but there's, it's complicated to model it. So how long before the sea levels are 60 feet higher? Hard to say, but it's already locked in. And I sit on the science committee, um, in addition to the climate committee and financial services, and we get, you know, our, the top scientists from NOAA and NASA and, and, you know, private agencies who come in. And what they've told us is that the best estimate is that by mid, if we eliminated all CO2 emissions yesterday, globally, the, we would see fairly, with fairly high degree of certainty, two feet of sea level rise by mid-century. That means that within the time span of current 30-year mortgages in Miami Beach, those properties in Miami Beach are gone. That is the reality that we are facing right now. Um, and maybe we're a little late, maybe we're a little long, but this is the reality that we're all dealing with right now. Um, and I'm gonna keep scaring you for a little bit, but then I promise you I'm gonna get happier. Um, the, the IPCC has been saying for a long time that we have to, you know, in the words of Glasgow, we have to keep 1.5 alive. We have to stay under one and a half degrees of warming. Um, and because if we get above that point, there are irreversible changes that we will not change. You know, we, we permanently will destroy coral reefs. We, um, you know, huge melt-offs of, of ice sheets, um, you know, things that I got to see as kids that a lot of you all got to see as kids. You will never be able to show your kids, you know, from glaciers and Glacier National Park, forests that are going to be gone, um, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. We got to stand at 1.5. Um, now, if you read the IPCC report that just came out, it says that we're at two degrees of warming. Now you gotta read a little bit into the details to see that because it, the headline says 1.1, but what it actually says is that we've had two degrees of warming from anthropogenic CO2 emissions, greenhouse gases more broadly, and that's been offset by 0.8 degrees of cooling from soot and aerosols we've, been, we've put into the air that are gonna settle down, but have a cooling effect. And, and Jim Hansen, um, uh, Dr. Hansen, just did this assessment that he said, if we eliminated all fossil fuels tomorrow, while we would see a decline in temperature starting in about you know, a, a decade or two, we'd actually see a huge acceleration in warming in the, in the intervening decade because the reduction of all that soot would cool the planet. Um, this is going to date me a little bit, but when I was in college, Mount Pinatubo erupted. It was an awesome ski year in New England um, <laughs> because there was all that, all that dust in the air. Um, and so this is our challenge. So we've already overshot. Um, 
Now, what that means is that in the words of Winston Churchill, um, the era of procrastination of half measures of soothing and baffling expedience has come to a close and we have entered an era of consequences. We are out of time. I, you know, I, I tell some of my colleagues who are saying, like, I pledge to reduce CO2 to zero by 2050. No, I'm more virtuous than you, I say by 2030. Um, it, any plan to get to zero emissions later than about 1998 is naive. We've, we've already overshot. So we have to get to zero as quickly as we can. Um, and then we have to go backwards because we really, Bill McKibben is right. We have to get back to something like a 350 parts per million in the atmosphere, which is removing a lot out of it. Um, if that doesn't scare you, you're not paying enough attention because not only do we have to get to that level, but we have to find a way to get to that level in a way that doesn't condemn the population of the planet to you know, pre-industrial lifestyles um, and do that with a much larger population that's on the planet right now. Um, this is now officially the end of the depressing part of our conversation. Um, but, I, but it's important to understand that because the scale of what we have to do is daunting. And I come back to the Australia. The technology is easy. It's the politics that are the crunchy bits. So let's talk about why the technology is so easy. And at, at a big high level, the energy, food, healthcare, you know, the, the big things we need we have never been totally comfortable creating a regulatory environment that is completely capitalistic for those sectors, nor have we ever been completely comfortable with a regulatory environment that's, that's completely socialistic. We, we want the power of markets because they're so capital intensive. We want people to have incentives to innovate and all that good stuff that entrepreneurship does. But at the same time, we, because we're good and kind and decent and ethical human beings, we don't want to tell grandma, you know, sorry about your diabetes. I'm sorry your insulin didn't stay refrigerated. But there was a weird supply and demand shock on the grid and you couldn't pay your electric bill. So we shut off your refrigerator. Right. So we, so we always have this tension between we recognize that we want to get the access to this. And so there's always been these parts of our energy system that are traditionally capitalistic, parts that are traditionally socialistic. And, and that's good and healthy and fine. But, but what it means is that if you look at the deployment of energy assets that are in our system, the choices that are available to consumers, and you tell yourself, I live in a free market and the choices that are out there are the way an efficient market allocates capital, what you have immediately signaled is that you have never actually spent any time in, a, in the actual energy market because that's not the way energy markets work. They're actually deeply inefficient for reasons that are structurally designed into the system. We electrified our country by giving regulated utilities monopoly rights where they had the exclusive right to provide power at a rate that was set by the government in exchange for making sure that everybody had access to, to electricity. It was a massive social program. We increased literacy rates. We did all sorts of stuff but it ain't capitalism, right? <laughs> that was a regulatory management program. You could go on through other parts of the system to understand you know, quite how distorted that is. And it's this weird thing, like economics actually does a really bad job of understanding the opportunity cost that's lost from economic inefficiency because we don't have good economic models that say how people inefficiently allocate capital. We have good models that say how they efficiently, but we, we don't live in an efficiently allocated capital market. So put this in context, the United States, uh, we have a slightly over $20 trillion a year GDP. We consume a little over 100 quadrillion BTUs of primary energy a year. Not fossil energy, not just primary energy. You know, how much you know, water running through the dams, coal that we burn, et cetera, on the list. Primary energy, however we convert it, separate issue. But a little over 100 quadrillion BTUs, a little over $20 trillion of GDP. Those numbers are huge, so let's just divide them down. We generate about 20 cents of economic activity for every thousand BTUs of energy we consume. If we were economically efficient, then that would be limited to some, some fundamental law. Germany, that has a pretty, pretty, good, pretty good economy, pretty vibrant, they got the same access to talent and people and technology we have. They turn a thousand BTUs into 33 cents of economic activity. The UK does 38 cents. Switzerland, 51 cents. So you have to ask yourself, like, 
do we have a technology problem? Because if it is, how are these countries that are, are really lovely places, go visit there. They're, you know, they're, they're, you, know you, you wouldn't feel like you were trading off your lifestyle choices to go live in any of those countries. How is it that they generate two and a half times as much quality of life per unit of energy input as we do? And the answer is they made a whole series of different choices. One of the really interesting conversations that we had with multiple people at, 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 at the, COP, the COP in Glasgow was that if you look at, at sort of the history of governments, um, the United States, Britain, France, we all sort of came up with the idea of democracy around the same time. Um, but in Europe, it was created where the, the population had already spread across the continent. And so the structures of democracy, you know, the same, you know, John Locke, the same sort of people who put these principles together, but the structures of European democracy were predicated on the idea that the resources are all broadly allocated and we need to figure out how to distribute them within a democratic form of government. In the United States, by contrast, we killed all the natives for all practical purposes. And so we designed a form of democracy that contemplated essentially infinite resources. And, and that worked for a long time, but it created rules and structures that are just very different from the rules and structures, even though we started from the same basic ideologies we were trying to follow. And that gets heavy into political science, but it explains a lot of those gaps. And one of the most significant ones is that the, the United States subsidizes the fossil fuel sector by $650 billion a year with a B. This morning, we just passed the the, the biggest, the Build Back Better, the biggest climate and clean energy bill that has ever passed the Congress. I have tremendous pride for what we do. I'm really, really excited about what we just did. That bill has within it $550 billion of incentives for clean energy over the next 10 years. So fossil fuel gets $650 billion per year. We just passed the biggest, most ambitious set of incentives for clean energy. That's $550 billion over 10 years, which means that this huge bill, all that you've heard in the news of why are you being so ambitious, it's going to be distort the economy, there's going to be too much inflation, blah, 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 in the words of Greta Thunberg. If we increased it by a factor of 10, we would still have a playing field tilted in favor of fossil energy. So we, we have created incentives in our economy that incentivize resource consumption rather than resource conversion. Um, and that's, that's depressing. It's frustrating, but, but it's also a huge opportunity, um, because it means that things you think you know about the economy and things we could do are, are backwards and actually it's much easier. Why is the coal industry dying in this country? 15 years ago, 50% of our power came from coal. Today, they're less than 30%. Realistically, it's not because of things that folks like me are doing in Congress. It's because they're getting their butt kicked in the market. Um, that if you build a solar panel, if you build a wind turbine, if you build a geothermal plant, if you insulate your house, all those things leave a lot more money in your pocket than burning, burning coal. Um, because there's this thing that is sort of obvious, but too often gets overlooked, that if you can give yourself a cold beer and a hot shower without burning fossil fuel, that means you can give yourself a cold beer and a hot shower without having to pay for fossil fuel and you leave more money in your pocket. And so we've got this huge economic incentives. We've seen um, Bloomberg just put a report out last week that said that the, the cost of equity capital in the fossil fuel sector right now is running about 20%. The cost of equity capital in the wind, solar, geothermal, clean energy space is running 3 to 4% because, because markets have figured this out as well and saying, what would you rather invest in? Something that has zero marginal operating cost and no volatility or something that has a greater than zero marginal operating cost and a high volatility. And so you're seeing this flood of capital that goes over there. Um, electric vehicles have gone from this niche thing that you know is kind of annoying and has low range to 300 miles of range. Awesome acceleration, they're super fun. Trust me, I have one, it's a lot of fun and they're supercharger stations and it's no inconvenience um, to use them. And now you can go through and get these things out. Um, so, you know, so we have all of these huge incentives um, to actually make this modification, but we have to figure out how to get there in a way that still acknowledges that there was a reason why, why we, we had this initial tension between capitalism and socialism. We, we do still have this question about what do we do to make sure that everybody has access to energy? Because it's true. If we just let markets run their course, they'll do some weird things. Um, so, you know, part of that is, is the energy access 
part of that is that we've we've never really monetized externalities. Some of those are pollution externalities. Some of that's the way that we operate the grid. You get paid for generating a kilowatt hour of electricity. For the most part, you don't get paid in any significant way for uh, you know improving the power factor of, on the grid or balancing phases or you know reducing harmonics injection in the system. We expect the sort of the socialized system to provide that. But lots of people don't get paid for doing that, and that creates some inefficiencies. Um, the just as an aside, I'll give you. A, I got to not name names, but this is a story that I think is just worth telling because it gives you a sense of how distorted the energy is, the industry is. Many many moons ago, I built a project uh, at, a, at a location in New England. I'll leave it at that. And it was a location in New England where the uh, uh, it was it was a jail, so the the folks who were in charge had the uh, always had holstered firearms um, on their side. We, the project was designed to take high pressure steam they were buying from the municipal steam system and it was, it was being throttled across a valve um, in order to heat the jail cells. Um, we put a little turbine in to capture the energy that was being thrown away across that valve and generate almost free electricity. I can bore you on the thermodynamics, but economically, basically free electricity. Um, cleans up the grid, saved them a bunch of money. We spent two years waiting for the electric utility to allow us to connect that to the grid in spite of the fact that there was no way we could export power onto the grid, raising safety concerns. There weren't really safety concerns. They just didn't want to lose the revenue. Two years, they blocked that from going on. Didn't really lose them that much money, but they wanted to send a signal to anybody who might come and infringe on their utility territory that they shouldn't do it because they were going to use two years. That system finally started up and is still operating to this day, not because we came to some agreed settlement on the technical rules, it came because because at one point, one of the gentlemen who worked in the jail put his hand on his hip and said to the utility engineer, you got two choices in front of you right now. You can leave this building your way or you can leave this building my way. And the utility engineer said, are you threatening me? And the guy said uh, in a rather thick New England accent, you goddamn right I'm threatening you. And that was how they connected that system to the grid. I tell you that story because anybody who says that what you see on the electric system or in our energy system is an inefficient allocation of capital subject to Adam Smith's invisible hand is misunderstanding the realities of that system. So how do we, how do we fix that, right? Because we've got this great opportunity to go forward. And that gets to why the politics are so crunchy. The, the first reason the politics are so crunchy is that the energy sector is massively capital intensive and produces a commodity product. Um, that makes it extremely lowercase c conservative, right? It's really hard to raise the capital. Once you have the capital raised, your, your investors, your bankers um, don't want to see that capital go away until it's paid for. And this isn't the sector where you make, you know, the kind of margins you make if you develop a Candy Crush app. You know, if you make eight, nine percent margins in the utility industry, you're doing pretty well. Well, that's 10 years till you get your money back. That means that within the energy industry, losers will always cry much more loudly than winners cheer. The, the folks who have that capital tied up know what the consequences of regulatory change will work hard to prevent that. And the beneficiaries are the entrepreneurs who haven't had the great idea yet. The consumers who aren't even at the table because they can't contemplate that that's here. So that's a challenge. It's a communications challenge, but it's a challenge. Second challenge is that think, go back to those numbers from Switzerland. If we could cut our energy use by a factor of two and a half and have the same level of wealth, or if you'd prefer, we we'll do that the other way, we could cut our CO2 emissions by, or I'm sorry, you could, I'll get confused on the algebra. You've got the idea. We're talking about huge amounts of dollars in the $20 trillion economy, We're talking about you know 60% reductions in spend. I don't think it's hyperbolic to say that actually embracing clean energy, which is also embracing clean energy, would be the biggest wealth transfer in the history of our species from energy producers to energy consumers. Like I said, I'm not being hyperbolic. What, is, what does that mean practically? Like that's not just, not just in terms of people's self-interest, but that's a huge amount of money that's flowing through the economy. Um, it's a huge amount of money flowing back into people's pockets. You could probably make the argument, and I'll leave this to economists, if you, cut your, if you cut the amount of money you have to spend to run the economy by a factor of 40%, that's probably GDP decretive, right? There's less money flowing through the economy, you're getting better quality of life, 
Think of all the things that index to inflation, your social security benefits. Like, how, how do you even think about that, right? Those are crunchy bits in the politics. Um, we have a almost every technology that you think about as being part of this clean energy transition is a huge investment in labor productivity. You know, th think about all the people who work at a coal plant and then think about next, next time you drive by one of those, you know, one of those community solar developments over in Vermont, uh, you know, or somewhere around you, count the number of operators you see standing around that power plant. It won't take you very long, right? Um, if you buy an electric vehicle, you're taking, you're, you're, number one, you're buying a car that has vastly simpler supply chains, lots less, lots of less rotating equipment. You don't have the, you know, the, the whole industry is dedicated to transmissions and all this other stuff that's in there, fuel supply systems. You don't need any of that stuff. So there's a lot less labor that goes into making an electric vehicle. And then once you buy it, you go from 15,000 mile maintenance intervals to 100,000 mile maintenance intervals. So you got less labor on the front end as well. Well, historically, um, I think the only real sustainable way that we the economy is by boosting labor productivity. But I think you can also stipulate historically that every time we've made meaningful boosts in labor productivity, we haven't treated workers real well. There's a, you know, there's a, there's an old joke that's not really funny. So maybe I shouldn't call it a joke, but in a, in a utopia, you buy a robot and then you don't have to work anymore. In a dystopia, the robot fires you. Um, right? Which direction are we going as we boost labor productivity? And, and yes, we can stipulate that over time, Schumpeter was right. Uh, you know, these waves of creative disruption um, cause new people to innovate and create new jobs we never thought of. But I think you've also got to acknowledge that the people who have benefited from those tr transitions um, historically have not been the same people who got left behind in the first transition. And so, and so there's a, there's an understandable reluctance if you're a, coal miner in West Virginia, or you're a, you know, or, or you're a natural gas plant operator in down state Illinois, there's a natural assumption for you to say, I'm probably not going to be dealt, dealt with very well in this transition either, because you didn't deal with my grandpa very well when you industrialized the farm, right? Um, so the politics are the crunchy bits. Um, last big reason that it's so hard is that it's really complicated. I mean, just in, in our conversation just now, we've touched on economic theory, capital budgeting, environmental science, thermodynamics, state federal energy law, um, political science. There's, there's a lot of people who are experts in some of those. There's very few who are experts in all of them and, and therefore very few people who I think have the, are in a position to really gather all these things together, understand the opportunities and synthesize the solutions. And yes, as a Thayer grad, this is a, this is a, this is a glaring plug for a well-rounded Thayer engineering liberal arts education. And I'm not just saying that because the audience, we need people who have that ability to sort of think cross-disciplinarily because there's, there's too few of them out there. Um, so how do we get through this and, and think about where we go from to the future? Number one, I take some encouragement both domestically and from our meetings in, in Glasgow, that in many ways, the markets are leading the politics. Um, we're seeing huge deployments of capital, trillions of dollars that are flowing into this. Um, we heard a, uh, you know, in the United States, it's a lot easier to get bipartisan support to protect people from the consequences of global warming than it is to get people to stop burning fossil fuels. We were criticized in Glasgow that United States investors are vastly more willing to invest in reducing the use of fossil fuel than they are to mitigate the, the risks. In other words, there's a lot of US banks that are happy to go build solar farms in India. There's very few who are willing to build levees in Bangladesh. Right? <laughs> and, and, and so we're seeing this, this, this transition happen. The markets are pushing through there. And the issues that that's going to raise in terms of technology deployment, the equity of diffusion, how we're going to equitably allocate the economic gains that comes through. So we skew more towards a utopia than a dystopia. We have to deal with that as regulators, all of, all of us as citizens, regardless of whether or not we consciously lead from the regulatory perspective. So we need to get out in front of that. Um, but it's a good problem to have. Still problem, but it's a good problem. We need to be really honest about the labor impacts. It is true. You've probably seen a bunch of announcements from the White House and people in my line of work that this Build Back Better Act will create 7 million new jobs in the clean energy space. It's true. It's probably an understatement. I vouch for it. We should embrace it. It's going to create a ton of jobs. We also need to acknowledge that we are creating 
probably a decade of construction jobs and getting rid of a lifetime of operating jobs. And so how does, how does that transition look like? What happens to those folks once the assets are constructed? Um, how do we, it's, it's hard to think about how to protect worker rights when you're working for one employer one year and another employer another year, as opposed to if you're 30 years at the power plant. Um, those are equity issues we have to think through. Um, we, we need to avoid the temptation to say that rising tides lift all boats. That's only true for slowly rising tides. Um, tsunamis tend to, tend to create a lot of collateral damage. And the rate of change we have to make, the rate of change that market's already making is a tsunami. I've spent a lot of time um, working on with Janet Yellen, with Gary Gensler, with the White House on in some legislation we passed as well to get our financial regulators to understand where this capital is moving so that we can put appropriate buffers up because we're, we're, on the, we're on the verge of some real sort of financial system destabilization, even as we're creating more wealth and we're destroying just because the flows of capital are so huge. Um, we need to take away the subsidies. We couldn't do that in the Build Back Better Act. We couldn't get the consensus to take the subsidies away. So as much as we're still doing all this good stuff, we're trying to drive as fast as we can into the future and we've still got the emergency brake on. Um, so we need to get that done and get a consensus around that. Um, and, uh, and of course we need to be cross-disciplinary. The last thing that we need, and then I'll stop to hear your questions, is that if you acknowledge that we are not constrained by technology, which we aren't, if you acknowledge that we aren't constrained by capital, which we aren't, if you acknowledge that we're not constrained by the laws of thermodynamics or the laws of economics, which we aren't, and that the only thing we need to change is the laws of the United States, which is great because I don't know how to change the laws of thermodynamics or economics, um, then, then the one thing that we are lacking a supply of, the one place where we're limited is ambition. Um, and, and I personally find that pretty inspiring. Um, because, because all of us and all of you students who are sitting here, that for this to happen, what, what it demands is leadership. Leadership that, that is hard. Leadership that says we know where we have to go. Not leadership that says I'd love to go there, but my voters don't support me. I'd love to go there, but uh, my shareholders wouldn't support me. Um, you know, I'm, I'm going to guess that everybody in this room who at some point has done a thermodynamics problem set, if you, if you said to your professor, the majority of the people I talk to do not understand the first or second laws of thermodynamics, and therefore I've designed, decided to dedicate my life to perpetual motion machines, that would not get you an A grade. <laughs> but on the other hand, how many folks in positions of leadership say, you know, I'd love to do something about climate change, but you know, the majority of Americans just don't believe it's real. It doesn't matter. You got to lead. So that's our challenge. That's your challenge. I thank you for having me here. I thank all the people at Thayer for giving me the foundation to get to a point where I could be here today. And uh, with the time we have left, more than happy to answer any questions that you all have.